I think, um, to be honest, Similarly, there's probably a couple of things that we notice here across the country and it actually sort of happens internationally as well. So um, research has actually shown us that girls aged 12 to 25, I should say girls and women, are actually at a substantially increased risk of mental health and illness issues. Um, and that's due to lifestyle factors, due to several different things. Um, that then obviously has a quite a large impact on their physical activity involvement. Um, Something in particular around sport that, again, our research has showed us that girls in particular around the ages of 14, 15 and above um, are also starting to deal with things such as schooling, studying, uh, relationship management, um, juggling work and life, they might have to build an income. Um, and then physical activity naturally, so that's their participation in sport, does tend to drop off. So where they may have started in cricket, playing in backyards and picnics and maybe a bit of beach cricket if you're lucky enough, um, those things sort of taper away as less important factors as the girls age and as they grow a little bit older. Um, and I think something in particular that we're each state and territory, so someone in my role um, are working quite closely with Cricket Australia on, um, are driving initiatives around the country um, depending on the group of girls and it's a very tailored approach, um, basically so that we can help girls see that cricket is very flexible. Um, there are obviously still a lot of stereotypes around cricket and a lot of girls as they get a little bit older, as you've said, do drop off because they see their brothers playing, they see their dads playing. Um, you might drive past a cricket game on a weekend and it might be a one day -er. Um And girls sort of see that as something that's not really interesting to them. They want activity that's short, sharp, fast and fun, um, things they can do with their friends and things that mean that they've still got other time in the day to go and do work, to go and do study. Um, to go and hang out with their friends that, you know, go shopping or play other sports. So um, we're really seeing that cricket is something that we're working with girls and with community members, um, multicultural groups, to try and understand how it varies from family to family. But I think the other important factor is that we're really working for cricket to be a sport that fits into the lifestyle of those girls and not the other way around. Um, we really don't want girls to think that they have to change to fit what cricket has always been and what cricket traditionally is. Um, when you think back when cricket was created and made up, it was not designed for women and girls. So um, what we're trying to do is help the girls understand that we're there to help them get involved in whatever way they want to get involved in. So um, it, it obviously has been quite a challenge with bringing girls to see and helping them and their families in particular see that cricket really is a sport for all um, and that there's lots of different ways regardless of age, gender, you know, cultural backgrounds, um, time, cost, all of those barriers um, that we're really working really closely with the community, with all of those people to make sure that, um, that girls don't drop off anymore, that they do see that cricket can fit their lifestyle no matter what age they are. So, still working on it though. <laughs> Quite interesting, particularly around the third point there, but Funnily enough, in WA, I actually think that COVID's probably um, provided us with a little bit of an opportunity if we take some silver lining thinking, um, particularly around the fact that a lot of these ladies and girls across the full pathway, whether they're in the community space or in Premier Cricket or um, at the top end of the talent pathway, a lot of them actually didn't get a taste of their winter sport. So usually they would participate in the winter months in whatever it may be. The biggest participation sport for females during winter is netball, um, but you know, all the other winter sports are there. Um, usually they will have had their couple of months of their winter sport and come off the back and that's sort of an existing challenge that in a standard season we see. Um, with COVID sort of throwing a couple of curveballs in there, we've actually had an increase, another increase in participation already in, in WA. Um, and I would be guessing that potentially with a couple of other st states such as South Australia, um, who probably quite similar to WA in that respect, pre their COVID um, outbreak. Um, I think a lot of the ladies have actually gone and, and girls have gone, we desperately want to get our hands on some sport. What's, you know, what's open and what's ready to go? And, for us in WA cricket, we were right on the ball and ready to go there. So um, 
I think COVID's actually probably, rather than dented our um, participation and involvement, I think it's actually given us an opportunity um, and something that our general manager in community cricket in WA, Joe Davies, um, has said is change is opportunity. Um, and that's something that I think our WA staff have really taken on board. So it's a little bit of a strange one. And we in WA off the back of in the 2019-2020 season, we had a 45% increase in female participation in WA, which is obviously massive. Um, and the national increase was for female participation was 11.4%. So all over the country, but particularly in WA, we had huge growth and numbers and lots of women and girls picking up a bat um, all over the state and having a go, which was incredible, um, which now does set us up with a bit of challenge in terms of how do we keep them playing? How do we keep that momentum going and keep them in the game at whatever level, at wherever they're happy to play, whether it's social cricket, um, whether it's playing a bit of cricket in school, in their cricket program, um, whether it is having a hit with mum or dad or your siblings in the backyard that's still playing cricket. So um, that's probably the biggest challenge for us right now. And again, I would be guessing that that would be a national challenge. Um, obviously in WA, because we did have the largest participation growth according to the census last year, that that's probably more so a challenge for us because we've got some big numbers. Um, to sort of carry on, but um, we're all ready to go. It's a challenge we're ready to take on. Um, and we obviously get incredible support, incredible support from the other states and territories as well as, well as from Cricket Australia. So um, that's probably the main challenge that I can see from where I stand. Um, and I think in terms of foreseeable challenges, that's obviously a bit of a tricky one. I think COVID's still got a, a few tricks tucked up its sleeve. Um, I think in particular leading into this season and probably the next season and a half or so, we'll probably still see a couple of the fallout or the ripple effect of COVID. Um, and in that, I mean how other sports react, what other initiatives other state sporting bodies put in place to um, engage women and girls into their games. Um, I work quite closely with my counterparts in our local sports, so um, football, hockey, netball, that kind of thing. Um, and they're all feeling the same sort of pressure. So I think in terms of what we may see down the track in terms of challenges or, you know, potential successes, similar to what I've said, you know, changes opportunity. So um, I would say it's probably going to be how other sports react, what other initiatives are put in place, what funding there is ongoing. There may be funding that's been there previously for clubs and volunteers and um, parents and families that might have dried up that might not be there anymore. So we're obviously extremely fortunate um, in cricket in WA and in Australia to have the support of, of Commonwealth Bank. Um, and this year we rolled out with Cricket Australia support the next innings female participation funding. And that idea being around what's next. How, how, how else can we help women and girls engage in the game and what can the game give back to them and their family. So um, seeing how we can continue to do what we do as, as cricket deliverers and supporters and you know just people who love the game um, is probably going to be a huge challenge ahead for us. Um, but I think we're all, I mean, our, we've got an incredible team here. I work closely with, I've had a chat to Owen before and I work closely with a couple of the other people who are responsible for the female portfolio in their state and territory. And of course you had a chat to Jane Moffat yesterday, who's amazing. Um, so I think there's no doubt that we're all ready and willing to, you know, pick up the bat and go in for our innings because it's, it's, it's not gonna be easy for any sport, I think, but um, at the end of the day, our main and primary goal will always be to get more women and girls involved in cricket. What that looks like as of right now is probably a little bit of a mystery, but, um, but we're ready and keen to go. Absolutely, 100% yes. I think um, last season, so in the 2019-2020 season, they launched the standalone competition um, and we had incredible feedback from families, regardless of gender, background, any of that, everyone was embrace the competition and embrace the ladies having their own you know individual big bash competition for the women um, I think a really big thing that we're seeing as a theme coming out of women and girls participating in cricket is that you can't be what you can't see 
Um, and that's a huge thing is that particularly when we engage girls in those younger years, so as Owen talked about the pathway and sort of what junior cricket looks like in that master class, so with girls who are aged sort of seven to ten years old, they start to sort of understand the concepts of a pathway and start to sort of understand where they might be able to go if they keep playing cricket. Um, whether that's sort of playing just for fun and with your friends or whether that does mean playing seriously. And as they get a little bit older, they do understand that cricket can give you so much more than a sport. Um, having the women playing WBBL is the definition of, you know, this is what you could be, this is where you can go. Um, aside from the fact of them all being incredible athletes, um, they're all just really wonderful role models. And that's obviously a huge um, ticket item on, in particular, in the WA female strategy, but in the national female participants participation strategy. Um, there are four sort of focuses or game changes that we're working on for this coming season and the seasons ahead and one of them is um, sort of growing opportunities for female coaches um, and sort of seeing girls and women grow into those roles at the top end um, and having the role models in the WBBL whether these ladies realise it or not that these young girls are looking up to them saying oh I could do that one day you know that could be me if I keep playing. Um, or, you know, the fact that they're just really good people, that they're wonderful role models outside of cricket as well, that when they do player appearances, they come down and talk to the kids and the families about things that are maybe not cricket related as well. So, I, yeah, I think it, it is actually a bit of a, it is was a bit of a kick to the guts when we, you know, with because of COVID that we couldn't have any local games in WA and I'm sure a lot of the other states and territories were feeling that as well. Sydney were darn lucky, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, they didn't really have the community engagement either. So it was a bit of a shame, but I think the fact and the, that we still got a lot of the games broadcast, that the games were still put on, you know, online to watch or on the TV, that it still means that the girls can still see that in the face of adversity that the WBBL ladies are out there playing, um, that it, you know, it takes a lot more than COVID to, to stop them from playing cricket. So. Um, and they did an incredible job. So I think the other really big thing here is that a lot of the WBBL ladies are obviously playing the Australian women's team. Um, and I think most people know now that uh, they were voted Australia's favourite sporting team. Just overall, not male or female, they were Australia's favourite sporting team. And I think that's the behaviours and the, you know, the attitudes that they represent is resilience, teamwork, support, um, you know, female role models, it's in the face of adversity, you know, everything can be overcome if you just put a little bit of effort and hard work in. So um, having the WBBL women with their own competition, um, with their own time slot, with their own sort of season is something that's absolutely invaluable to female participation for girls all the, through, all the way through to senior women. I go down to women's games on a Sunday afternoon in Perth in WA and um, they, there are some die-hard fans, I'll tell you that much. They're just, oh, Caitlin, when, about, when can we get tickets? You know, in a normal season, they're always begging me for tickets to come and watch. So um, so there, there is huge support here, as no doubt there is all around the country. And I think everyone else in um, with a female participation portfolio in other states and territories would agree with me in saying that um, they provide hope an opportunity to girls who's starting and it, it may not be that they want to go all the way through but just being able to see that someone has walked the path they've walked before them means that it makes things a lot easier um, and hopefully you know down the track we will be able to see more and more diversity in the women's team as well which would be amazing but we're getting we're getting there we're doing well <laughs>